I had plans tonight. They fell through. So for the record, <laughs> there were attempted plans. Hello everybody, my name is Catherine. If you subscribe, you can call me Kath. Right off the bat, my first instinct here as I'm jumping into the video is to admit that I'm not an expert here, but I actually feel like the more important thing to acknowledge is that none of us are experts. We're all figuring it out. It's not this static thing. And recently, thanks to my oversharing in Seattle series, which you heard a little bit from at the top of this video. You can check out the first three installments of that series up here, more coming soon. They invited me to be on an episode of their podcast to talk about this exact topic, which I thought was very relevant. A lot of what I'm kind of trying to overcome right now is the fear of coming across desperate. I can't really explain like how I've been conditioned this way or like why those thoughts come up for me, but they do. I, I I totally have that insecurity. Like when I'm first meeting somebody, like, are they gonna know that they're the only person that I can hit up to go do stuff? Like, these are the ruminations of a friendless person. So in this video, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and also include more voices to gather up what we collectively know about friendship making. Before I do so, I want to hand it off to myself in headwear to introduce the sponsor of today's video. I am now beaned up and ready to supply a word from today's sponsor, which is Wealthfront. You may have noticed that I've made them somewhat of a consistent partner on my channel, and that is because of how much I align with their investing philosophies and have personally benefited from their services. For the uninitiated, Wealthfront is an automated investing service that really just relieves you from having to manage your finances all on your own. Their software was designed by experts, so no matter your risk tolerance or the reason behind why you're saving or investing, investing, you're backed up. They make it easy to get started with investing in just five minutes of your time, and then you can set it and forget it and let them handle the rest. Even in just the span of the four or five months that I've been working with them on my channel, I've noticed that they've made a lot of additions to their services and really made efforts to constantly improve the product. They've rolled out socially responsible investing options like renewable energy, and then most recently they launched their YouTube channel so that you you can get more bite-sized access to personal finance tips and deep dives into the product. You can check it out at the link below where I'll also have my personal Wealthfront link, invest.wealthfront.com slash catherout, where you will get a fat goose egg of management fees for up to your first $5,000 managed by Wealthfront. And you just need $500 initially to get started with your account. Thank you, thank you again to Wealthfront for supporting the labor hours that I put into this content. The first reality to confront here is that making friends is really a slow burn. You're gonna get there, but in the meantime, it's crucial to just let yourself off the hook for being alone for a while while you figure it out. Don't blame yourself for the speed it takes to actually make friends. I talked to my friend Brad about this. Some of the Catherout long haulers may remember him from my USC days, but since he graduated, he moved to Charleston, South Carolina without knowing a single soul. And here's what he had to say about timing and, you know, just being on your own. I did not know anybody, had no family, no friends, no acquaintances, no friend of a friend over there. Uh, so I was starting off with a totally fresh slate. It did take me a couple of months once I got there, and we'll get into that in a little bit. That said, after about six months of living in Charleston, I did start to kind of develop some good friends. It's one thing to feel lonely and like everyone's hanging out without you. Trust me, I'm there somewhat often, but it's another to double down on it by punishing yourself for it and bringing your spirit down even more. It's okay to feel that way. I'd have these feelings the first few weeks that I moved to Seattle when I didn't know anybody. I'd be at the farmer's market or grabbing takeout or furniture shopping, looking around me and just, you know, feeling a little down, expectedly so, because it just seemed like everybody out there was coupled up or enjoying the day out with a huge group of friends. If everybody else was there solo, I could have been having a perfectly good time, but I allowed my comparison of my situation to theirs 
to ruin some very pleasurable activities. How can I call myself a hedonist if I'm ruining my own fun by judging myself relentlessly? It's just not fair. Like the comfier that you get on your own, the less you'll dwell on your friendlessness. Here are a few of my ways that I was able to still enjoy my time without a strong social life. Number one, this never fails me ever. And that is just to pretend that you're on a business trip and that you have no other options but to go out into the city or your town or your rural community on your own. Like make it a fun little POV exercise, do it ironically, like whatever it takes. But the reason that helps me is that when I did travel for work, I had no resentment or ill will towards myself when I'd go out to dinner alone or see a museum or go to a comedy show because I had no other option. For me, it was all about the illusion of the alternative that held me back. Like in Seattle, I placed the expectation on myself that I should have friends there because that's where I live. But when I'm on business trips, I'm like, of course I'm going to dinner alone. I'm on a business trip alone. I don't know anybody in Milwaukee. Like, <laughs> and so I had so much fun with myself because I never felt insecure that people could see me out alone because I knew that that's what I had to do. That's what I signed up for. Um, but in Seattle, it doesn't feel like I signed up for that. So I apply that mindset to when I'm going out on my own. Nobody knows why you're on your own. To be frank, nobody cares. And so as, as long as you're confident and you're secure, you're gonna have a much better time. Another thing that has saved me time and time again and just really lifted me up are artist dates, which is a concept Julia Cameron introduced in her book, The Artist's Way. I am reading it for the second time and I'm not religious, but that's some sort of Bible. It really is. It's about intentionally treating yourself to one-on-one -on -one time with yourself instead of defaulting to time alone as your last choice. You're dating yourself and taking yourself out. You can think of it as a signed play. Some of my favorite artist dates I've ever taken myself on are museum trips, picnic slash hammock slash reading dates. You can do color walks where you pick a color and then just follow that wherever you see it and explore some place you've never been before. Estate sales, checking out the street art where you live. Be really cool and confident with walking out and going for a hike by yourself. Go to a coffee shop by yourself. You can bring a book with you and read if you're worried about being bored. Uh, if you drink, go have a beer somewhere. Go to a brewery or something. Um, there are plenty of things that I think you can do to try to discover your new city uh, and maybe meet some people along the way. To complement those two things, I'm also an avid journaler. When I get into these sort of self-defeating thought spirals about my social life, when you go to start writing some of that stream of consciousness down, it becomes a lot more apparent how cruel, unnecessarily cruel you're, you're being to yourself. So once you do catch that, the best way to set yourself up in a more gentle direction is to do some affirmations. And trust me, I have not taken affirmations very seriously in the past, but when you're in your like real moment of need, they can help your brain do a U-turn. Let's say some together. There is nothing wrong with me. I am kind to myself and I give myself what I need when I need it. I am doing the best that I can. I am never alone. I am always surrounded by love. I am patient with myself. I will stop needing a constant social current to pull me. I am discovering new things about myself every day. I talked to my friend Michelle about how she confronted loneliness when it first crept in. She moved from Sydney, Australia to Berlin without a job, a place to live, or anybody she knew there. So if she can do it, you can too. Trust. Stay connected with the people back at home or, you know, long-standing connections that you do have. Um, I think it's so valuable just to go, hey, I, I do have good people in my life, people who love me, people who know me well, and they like me for it. And... I am a good person <laughs> like maybe I'm lonely now but that's just because of circumstance not because of who I am as a person that was always important for me to keep in mind to some extent I tried to stay busy I tried to just take myself out um, the first sort of five or six weeks I didn't really know anyone all I had to do was what, find out what work out where to live and find a job um, which took a long time to do so I often was just at home all day every day um, and maybe once a week I would, yeah, cross paths with someone or, you know, start to make friends in that type of way. 
I also wanted to highlight the advice that my girl Sarah Wang shared. She also has a YouTube channel, so go check it out. I'll have it linked in the description. She moved from Michigan to Seattle two years ago and just has so many great philosophies about friendship in a new place. Loneliness to me is a feeling. It's not a state of being. It's and it feels a lot like sadness to me. So when I'm sad, my first thing I like to do is just start doing chores. Usually when I'm really sad, I'm overthinking, I'm creating scenarios in my head. So by doing chores, I'm able to distract myself and just focus on tangible things. It's also really therapeutic to see the progress of like dirty dishes to clean dishes, a dirty apartment to a clean apartment. So after doing all those chores, I'm in a much better state of mind because my environment is just a lot more peaceful and I've accomplished something. And at that point, if I'm still overthinking, I would journal, I would talk to my voice memos and work out what I'm feeling and kind of just ramble. Next, it is really crucial not to convince yourself that you will never meet people you click with. Because number one, it's just not true. For me, the detrimental thought tends to be that the people that I would wanna be friends with already have enough friends, so why would they possibly wanna hang out with me? Which is really just the scarcity mindset that we've all been conditioned to have coming out. Like we have been trained to operate and think that way by capitalism, which thrives off of competition in the idea of this out of reach 1%. So the only way to combat that is by building a mindset of abundance. And so I always try to reframe that scarcity voice by reminding myself that like when I lived in the Bay Area and I had a very strong support system of very long-term friendships, when I did meet someone new that I clicked with, I would always wanna welcome them into the fold. I never, on principle, wanted to reject them thinking I had too many friends. Like that's never a thought I've ever had so like why would anybody think that way um and i think especially in seattle like the seattle freeze is literally just directly feeding into the scarcity mindsets we're already dealt but in reality there could be an abundance of all things when you operate through the capitalist notion of scarcity you actually create more scarcity. Like if you think that no one's gonna wanna be friends with you because they have too many friends, you're just robbing them of another friend. Like that's literally, it's doing exactly what the system wants you to do, um, which is why it's so radical to behave abundantly. And when you're in that scarcity mindset, you can feel it and the people you're interacting with can feel it. Not to threaten you, but like genuinely, this is just something that I have realized which is very unfortunate, but just another reason why it's so important to cultivate this belief and trust that there's more than enough out there for you. Just like you don't wanna stay in relationships out of the fear of being alone. Len and Stella, thank you for that very important lesson. You don't want to enter into relationships out of fear either. That will never be the fertile ground of a fruitful relationship. And I hate to say it, this is what I talked about in the podcast, like that sense of desperation is almost palpable in a relationship rather than confidence in yourself and what you have to offer. So start to identify when you're in that fear-based scarcity mindset and just take note. Like don't attack yourself for thinking that way. It's what you're conditioned to do. Just take note of it, take stock of it, and then figure out how you want to supplant that. So for me, I recognize that my FOMO, my fear, is the strongest when I haven't really hung out with folks in a little while and then I'll get on social media and I'll see a bunch of people, regardless of whether they're even attainable to be my friends or not, this is the destructive part of it. Like they could be entirely parasocial relationships that would never cross my radar, but I'm just watching somebody have a birthday party with 40 people there and I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And that's where you have to shut it down. So, um, if that means turning off your Instagram for the first few weeks that you move somewhere new or just deleting the app when you find yourselves in more moments of internal crisis, that's the boundary you need to set to be in right relationship with yourself. My first year, I definitely felt a lot of FOMO because I was nervous that if I didn't go to every social event or everything that I was invited to, that eventually these people who were relatively new to me would stop inviting me. And that's just not the way to live. I think that is a very stressful mindset to have. Instead, it's a lot more helpful to view your friendships from a perspective of abundance. Like you have all these friends that you could hang out with rather than you have all these friends that you could lose. Once you've spent that time nurturing your relationship with yourself, it becomes much easier, or at least in my experience, much easier 
to connect with other people. So let's talk about it. What does the friendship market look like? Where are all the people? This is kind of where I feel like most of the advice collapses in on itself and you just hear the same thing over and over again and you're kind of looking for a different answer, like you want something easier than joining some sports team or putting yourself out there in any one way. But to me, it's most helpful to look at like the last, you know, handful of folks that I've met and started to become friends with and where I met them. And for me, it's YouTube, relative of a friend, friend of a friend of a friend, and past college classmate who I rarely ever crossed paths with. Like, that's my lineup of how I met the folks in my life, and I'll try to include some other people's maps of how they met folks. The most recent friendships I've made, one was through a mutual friend. My mutual friend connected me with her because she was moving to Seattle and needed some help learning about Seattle and apartment hunting. The three most recent friends I've made have been at a dog park, so I do have a dog. I go to this dog park every single day, and funny enough, my dog likes to hump every other dog at the dog park, and then I have to go up to their owner and apologize, and that has made me a lot of friends. So now it's me and three other dog moms, and we call ourselves the single dog moms, which some of us are no longer single dog moms, which is really funny because we were all women in our 20s with a dog living alone. Next source is friends of friends. This is the most eternal spring of friendship in my life. I have not made better friends than friends of friends. The unfortunate thing here is that you do need a friend for this to work. So that's also why I say it really only takes one person to get you going. Once you know one person, you can meet one of their persons. And then the cycle and the chain just goes from there. If you don't have one person in your city that you know yet, what I would suggest is going on your close friend story and literally just post and ask who knows or has met somebody that lives in X city. I've really only seen Anna Russett do this and she just put it on her public story. You don't even have to put on your close friend story, but I feel like a lot of people carry so much shame about like even just having the desire to um, find connection, which is dumb. So yeah, um, you never know whose eighth grade summer camp bestie is now living in the city you're in, and that's enough to go off of, okay? We're just looking for warm leads, baby. I've literally met up with a dude that after hanging out with someone I'd only met once before at a grunge show while I happened to be visiting Bushwick, and her friend, who I knew for all of two hours, mentioned to me that she met someone when she visited Seattle that was cool and fun. And that was literally enough to go off of. And we ended up getting along well. So you never know, it's worth a shot. And to me, that's where I would put most of my energy is people that your friends have vetted even a little bit. There's Bumble BFF. I'm not the girly to advise you on this because I have my own prejudices to overcome when it comes to friendship apps. TikTok I've also seen has been a portal to meetups. Like there's a queer meetup in Seattle that they'll do like a brunch every month. That looks really fun. Once you're on your city's TikTok, just keep an eye out for anybody that's you know, mentioning some event or some meetup or even wanting to make friends because that's an easy in. And then finally, what nobody wants to hear but has delivered on many occasions are activities. Be interested and you will be interesting and you will find other interesting people, okay? Kickball leagues, dance classes, language classes, church, volunteering. That's my starting lineup for you. But whatever you're interested in, like, I'm gonna join a woodworking class. I'm gonna do a poetry class. I'm gonna do a film photography class. I'm gonna do a ceramics class. My friend Michelle, who I mentioned before, like she really waited to figure out a hobby to plug herself into when she got to Berlin. And once she actually ended up doing it, it was so formative. I found out about the local improv scene, which I had not even considered being a part of anything like that. So you fast forward, I see that there is an an improv jam. So people just show up and sign up, put your name down and do whatever you want on the stage. Um, And so I went along to that. It was, I think, the first week that I was there. And I thought, these people seem like people I want to be friends with. This seems really cool. And so I went to sign up to improv classes, something I'd never considered before. But I thought, you know, why the hell not? Um, And saw that the classes that they'd started a couple weeks before, they were full. It was something like that. 
but I decided that I'd come back to it later. So in the end, what happened was about two weeks before the majority of my friends left is when I started those classes. And now most of the people I know in, in the city still um, are people who I met through improv. So <laughs> that's a long winded way of saying get hobbies. To me, this is where I struggle. Like in my three-ish months in Seattle, I've managed to meet a bunch of people maybe once or in passing, but how do you turn that into a secure relationship where you can call on each other to just do stuff? The most convenient thing to do is set up some sort of reoccurring date. So for example, with my friend that I met through a mutual friend, we were able to build that friendship because it's super easy to meet someone for the first time. Like, let's grab a coffee, let's learn about each other. But then it's hard to set up that second hangout. So what we started doing is we created this thing called a supper club. So with a couple other friends, once a week, every week, we go and try a new restaurant in Seattle. So it's a fun experience because we all are really into the food scene. So we can try new restaurants in Seattle. And then having it as a club, you can keep adding other people that also share that interest. And it also creates that structure for you to see them consistently until you build that friendship to a point that is strong enough that you invite each other to other things as well. A few of the things I've brainstormed are farmer's markets. If there's one in their neighborhood or one in your neighborhood and you both like going to those each weekend to get your produce or whatnot, just suggest that like, hey, let me know the next time you're going to the farmer's market, I'll go with you. And then you can kind of build a routine. Like I remember in college, I knew a couple people who would like always get together to watch Riverdale every week. For me now, like virtually with friends, we'll always talk about succession and insecure when they drop on Sunday nights. But if you can find somebody in your town that's watching those things, um, like if I were back in the Bay Area right now, I would be getting a couple of my girlies together and like meeting up on Sunday nights and just watching those together. This might be the most important thing I will say of the entire video, and maybe this is extremely common sense to each of you, but the best thing that I've done for myself as I've met up with people for the first time is figuring out what we wanna do the next time while on the first hangout. And not so explicitly as like, what should we do the next time, George? It's more so just like being observant about what they've mentioned or slyly mention something that you already kind of think would be a fun thing to do. So putting that into context, maybe you get to the ramen spot and you mention the trivia sign you saw up at the bar across the street. You ask if they've ever done that. You're like, oh, it's on Tuesday nights. We should totally do that. And they're like, yeah. And then you've basically already gotten their consent for like something you'd want to do the next time. Because for me, like someone I'm starting from scratch with, it's really hard to know like what they do in their free time and what they like to do. Like, are they going to want to go to an art fair with me? Are they going to want to kayak with me? Are they going to want to go mushroom foraging? Like what's their bag? If I don't have that knowledge after the first hangout, I sort of psych myself out and like overthink what to suggest we do the next time. Cause I don't know, dinner's fine, but it's like more fun to throw in other things that um, you've been meaning to check out in the city anyway. If they've mentioned that they just redecorated their apartment, say you'd love to see it. And then they'll probably invite you over. Like if they mention that you live really close to their favorite ice cream place, guess where you're going next time. If they mention, oh my God, I just found a really cool thrifting spot. Tell them you love to thrift and boom, you got plans. Like it is literally just ABC, always be closing. I hate to put it into sales knowledge, but it's literally just closing them on the second date on the first date. It's one of the best things you can do for yourself. And every time I don't do it, I regret it. So also, once you do hang out with someone for the first time, something really nice and sweet and wonderful to do that people have done to me and I've always really appreciated is texting them after you've gotten home or a few hours later or the next day and just letting them know that you had a nice time and just reassuring them that it indeed was a moment well spent because a lot of us are anxiously attached and may convince ourselves we talked too much or we were super boring or they hated us and like, just putting out there and reaffirming to them that you liked hanging out flatters them, makes them feel good. And then also conveniently, they'll usually say something to the effect of like, yeah, let's do it again. And then you can be like, oh, I'm out of town Monday through Wednesday, but like, are you free Thursday? We could do a little picnic in that park that you mentioned you've always wanted to hammock at. 
it can be as easy as that. Like, I'm not trying to be a dating coach here or anything, but like, these are things that like, I maybe subconsciously knew or had like noticed, but like putting these into like my friendship practice is so helpful. Um, and again, like to me, most of these things are so helpful because they prevent me from like getting into a self-defeating attitude um, and feeling like I have too many obstacles to actually continuing that relationship. Social media also makes a really easy point of engagement. There's some people that I've met that we like haven't followed each other the first time we hung out. And there's some people where we have, and like I can see a marked difference where First of all, you don't have to put all, put in all the legwork of figuring out what they like to do. You can just see what they like to do if they're posting about it. If they're going on hikes, you can suggest a hike next time. If you see that they roller skate and you do that too, you can drop a line in their freaking replies and get in their DMs and boom, you have an idea for another friend hangout right there. Um, and it just also in between the times where you can actually hang, hang out in person, it like keeps the current of the relationship going. Um, and then this one is like very much remnants of my type A self. I'm edging into my type A minus era right now, but um, I still know that like consistency is key. So the tip would be to actually just set a reminder in your phone to follow up with them. Like if you, are, you, if you don't already have a date plan to hang out again after you see them the first time, literally just go on your phone and like two weeks from now be like, text Jenny to hang out. And then that'll pop up. And for me, seeing that little red notification symbol pushing me to reach out allows me to get out of my head and out of the reasons why maybe I shouldn't do it and just do it. Like it's on your to-do list. And also when you're adjusting to a new place, there's probably a lot going on in your life and you honestly might just forget yourself to hang out again. And then at a certain point, if it's been too long, it's like, shit, it's been three months. Can I like see that person that I only saw once again? Is that weird? Like, I don't wanna be in that. I don't wanna be in that because that's my brain. So if you have a similar brain, set reminders. And then where does that leave us? Well, none other than who to be when you're with these people. How should you act? How should you perform your identity? Might be a hot take, but just be a thousand percent yourself. Lose your filter and be yourself. All of us have parts of our personality that takes effort to maintain. And if you are only showing those parts of your personality that take effort to maintain, it's gonna be extremely exhausting socializing. And also you're not gonna find the people that you can show the parts of your personality to that are easy to show and are energy giving rather than energy taking. I saw a really good quote that's kind of relevant. It goes, don't kill the part of you that is cringy, kill the part of you that cringes. As one TikTok I saw explained, just pretend that you're already friends. Pretend this is the 72nd time you're hanging out with this person. Tell them about things you're thinking about and your worries and some weird realization you had the other week. You will waste your time if you're not showing people who you are because then you're not gonna get the people that really match and are compatible with who you are, you know? So in closing, first of all, it is not your fault that you don't have community. It is capitalism's. And like, there are some people in my audience that aren't on the anti-capitalism train. And so they think it's a cop-out every single time I say that. But like, hate to break it to you, bestie, it's wild how systemic a system can be. Who would have thought? Capitalism thrives on us living separately and nuclearly because it can sell us more things when we live that way. If we're not comfortable borrowing tools and sugar and asking a neighbor for a hand with the cabinet we're trying to hang, guess what we do? We pay for TaskRabbit, we go to the store and buy more sugar, we buy our own drills instead of just borrowing. Like, that's just one example, but like, it makes a lot of sense why you probably do feel alone. There's also a fantastic podcast from the Seriously Wrong Boys on the power of loneliness and like, the way that loneliness is like foundationally set up in our culture, highly recommend. One of the best listens I've had all year. And to send you out, I want to include a few more clips from my very thoughtful friends because I cannot get enough of them. They've helped me so much on my journey. My biggest tip, something that has helped me a lot, is understanding my social capacity. Through trial and error, you can figure out what your idea of social capacity is and it might even change week to week. So for example, for mine, 
I have adapted it to my menstrual cycle because I find my energy levels vary a lot based on what week I am in my menstrual cycle. The first week after my period, that's when I have the most energy and I would try to plan about two things to do during the week with friends and then one to two things each on Saturday and Sunday. Towards the end of my cycle, right before I get my period, I am a lot more tired, but I have better focus. So I do a lot more things by myself. Maybe I put a little more hours into work, into maintaining my apartment. So I think understanding your social capacity is really helpful because then you can start planning social things ahead of time. So you can look at your calendar and reach out to people to fill up that two slots of social things you want to do for the next week. The other thing that I would really, really encourage is uh, I think that it can be a natural instinct when somebody moves to a new city to just hang out with as many people as they possibly can, do as much with as many people as possible. Uh, do not continue putting in effort into people who are not reciprocating that effort and who are not benefiting you in the long run. You want to make sure that you are only using your energy toward the people who are going to reciprocate that. Feel free to cut people out if you feel like it's uh, not a healthy relationship, if they're draining for you. You need to prioritize you, do what's best for you, so that again, you can find yourself and then ultimately find the people who you're looking for. Age is just a number, which you know, and I think everyone knows this and you hear it. And I was there in Berlin, I was 23, I turned 24, and I had friends who were 19. I had friends who were in their 20s, 30s, 40s even. Um, and none of it really mattered. Everyone was felt like they were in the same place in life. Uh, the one other thing that I will say, I, I know that Catherine asked for a couple hot takes. Um, the, the, probably my only hot take that I would have is um, you're going to find very few people in your life who are very good friends. You know, I did get lucky that when I moved to Charleston, I did find a couple good friends who, again, I still talk to today. But a lot of those people who I met when I went to Charleston, I just like don't talk to them anymore. Same thing with people who I'm sure you know from high school, from college maybe. You know, there are people who come and go in your life. You're going to find very few people who stick around for a long time. So don't get too hung up on freaking out if you haven't found a set of friends within the first, you know, month, two months of you moving somewhere. Uh, the odds are you're going to find somebody who, uh, you know, eventually could be a good friend down the road. But finding a good friend like that does take a little bit of time. So uh, don't get too hung up on that. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you all next time and catch.